Hello, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Clinton Presidential Center. And I'm Stephanie Street, and I serve as executive director of the foundation. And I'm so glad that you all are joining us for what I think will be a super fascinating program tonight. Um, Grace and Grit, a 50-year, Grace and Grit, not Grit, right? Grace and Grit, that's a little inside joke. Um, a 50-year res retrospective of Hillary Rodham Clinton's Arkansas years um, is really a, it's been a labor of love and I'm glad that we're finally, this is coming into the public domain. Um, and obviously our special guest here tonight, Dr. Uh, Angie Maxwell and Dr. John C. Davis. Um, the program tonight is being presented by the Clinton Foundation, um, the Clinton Library and the David and Barbara Pryor Center for Oral and Visual History, which we are all huge fans of. Um, before we move on with our program, I want to recognize the many elected officials that are here tonight. Thank you guys so much for coming out uh, and, and joining us for this conversation tonight. And also Dr. Jay Barth, my partner in crime, as I like to refer to him, to, to refer him. Uh, he is going to be speaking to you later tonight in the program. Um, Finally, a big shout out to our Clinton Center volunteers. I know they get tired of me saying this, but we literally could not open our doors on any day or night without them. We appreciate you all so very, very much. And our wonderful Clinton Center ambassadors and our members, our donors, obviously these types of programs would not be possible without your ongoing support. And we are all very, very grateful. Um, a little housekeeping, please silence your cell phones. And now I'm thrilled to introduce our panelists, whom you all know, and our program. Uh, 50 years ago, then Hillary Rodham took a leap of faith and moved to Arkansas. It's fair to say that Arkansas has benefited from her willingness to take that risk. Tonight, we will hear about her experiences settling in Arkansas in her own words. The program will feature excerpts from a forthcoming oral history that Secretary Clinton recorded in 2019 with the Pryor Center for the Arkansas Oral and Visual for Arkansas's Oral and Visual History. Uh, Angie and John will add contexts, explore the profound and lasting impact she made in the state, and discuss the oral history, which I had the privilege of sitting in on that. Um, was it four years ago, Angie? Of 2019, when Angie um, had that profound conversation with Secretary Clinton. And so tonight we'll get little excerpts, but I encourage you uh, to, if you're not able to attend the event in Fayetteville, which, when is that, John? So on the 29th at the Fayetteville Public Library, we'll, do the full we'll have the full viewing. But then it will be uploaded onto your website. and people Very shortly speak, thereafter. Very shortly thereafter. I promise you it is spellbinding. Um, do I need to introduce and say what you do, John, and Angie, what you can do? I think everybody would, probably yeah. knows that, so I'm going to skip that. And we're just going to get right into it. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please welcome Angie and John, and let's get this party started. So, as Stephanie said, what we're going to do is I'm going to give you just a little brief background about this project. Um, and then we will introduce um, six clips uh, that Angie selected. Um, and that's fitting because what you'll see in these clips, and, and it's really undeniable um, in, in these small portions of the overall interview, but if you get the opportunity, if you take the time to watch the roughly hour 40, hour 50 minute interview, you'll see that between uh, Secretary Clinton and Dr. Maxwell, you've got this wonderful rapport that develops um, they're sitting as two friends talking, and it wouldn't have happened uh, without the incredible um, preparation and, and just the uh, willingness to, to really go the extra mile uh, on this little project with Dr. Maxwell. So Dr. Maxwell deserves an enormous amount of credit. <laughs> and I'd also like to thank uh, Stephanie and everyone else that played a part in making it happen. It's, it's no small feat logistically, of course, to have uh, Secretary Clinton um, come. It was late November of 19 when um, the interview occurred. Um, and then we had, of course, the, the global pandemic, uh, which did lead to some, some pretty obvious delays as far as production. Um, but the, um, everyone really involved has been helpful in, in offering feedback. We, uh, over time at the Pryor Center, processed the interview. And we also 
had opportunities to add clips from our KTV archive collection to add context. Uh, we also need to recognize UA Special Collections. They had some wonderful footage and photography um, and, and other things that had been stored uh, over time that was very relevant and, and helpful. Um, and the, the Clinton House Museum also uh, had some wonderful material for us. And just before we start, I need to give uh, credit where it's due. I, I cannot claim anything uh, with this. I had the opportunity to join the Pryor Center last January. So this was already well into motion uh, with a bow on it. So uh, with us tonight, I do have two of our wonderful staff members at the Pryor Center, uh, Alessandro Salemi and Steph Leffler, uh, who both played key roles in the processing of this project. Uh, we also have my predecessor, uh, former executive director, uh, Bill Schwab, uh, who was uh, taking the lead from the Pryor Center perspective. Uh, Randy Dixon, um, Sarah Moore, uh, Susan Kendrick Perry, um, and many others played a role in this. So in, in true Hillary Clinton fashion, it took a village to finish this project. And so we're, we're really thrilled to share bits of it tonight. So let's jump in. Um, so the, the first clip uh, we have here, Angie, it's um, you and Secretary Clinton talk about how she quickly goes from working with John Doerr in preparation to you know, really help prosecute the case against President Nixon, right? And then her life abruptly changes. Um, she finds herself in our state, and I think uh, Stephanie mentioned this, but you know, she chose us. She chose Arkansas and built a life and career here. Um, so in this clip, I think, I think you're having a conversation about that transition. And I want to say first that, you know, when you get called to do this, when they say preparation, I mean, I don't, I don't know how you don't, um, go into 24 seven because the opportunity of a lifetime and what my goal was the whole time is there's a lot of stories that get told, you know, over and over. Um, and those are great, and we have those. But I wanted to try to dig a little bit deeper about what it was what it was really like to show. She was so young, and it was so abrupt. And I wanted to see what Arkansas looked like to her in the rearview mirror. And I think what you'll see is that the village that she speaks about so eloquently, she built here. She built that here. And I know there's all the stories about, you know, difficult moments and all that kind of stuff, but that's not what has lasted and what stays in our memory. It's that the people of this state had so much grace and grit. And I think there was a fondness that came out in the conversation um, that, you know, um, maybe, maybe you didn't feel in the moment, but now you see looking back how much good work was done and how much she admires the people of Arkansas. It was just a powerful day and it was all her. And I tried to put myself in her shoes to think, here you are graduating law school. And I know it's a fancy law school, yeah, but it's just, it's law school, you're young. And then she's picked to work on prosecuting the president of the United States. And they are doing a million note cards. That's how John Doerr worked. And and that's what she's doing all day, you know, evidence, evidence. And then when Nixon resigns, it's over. And the next thing you know, she is, calls the law school up and they say, sure, come on down. And two weeks later, she is teaching. She is the teacher to the students. Um, and that's 50 years ago. And that's her introduction to Arkansas. So we'll see this clip of her talking about how she prepped some of those, the enormous load they gave her in that first uh, semester. I kept thinking about going from that experience with John Doerr and how, in a sense, he was having, you know, your team, you know, teach this narrative of Watergate, explain it to the American people. Right. And you go straight into teaching right. in the classroom. Do you think that uh, affected your teaching style or, you know, what did, mm -hmm. um, how did you choose how you were going to teach those classes? Well, I was told, um, uh, a few days before the first class uh, that I was going to teach criminal law and criminal procedure. Uh -huh. I was going to run the um, Cummins Prison Project. I was going to teach trial advocacy and I was going to start a legal aid clinic. And so I figured that, 
you know, I'd never done any of that. Right. And I, <laughs> I needed all the good advice I could get. So uh, luckily there were a lot of lawyers in town and others who were really supportive uh, and, and my colleagues on the, on the faculty uh, as well. So when I started teaching, you know, the only model I had was how I was taught. Right. And, you know, both criminal law and criminal procedure were large courses because they were both requirements. And I was really, you know, very diligent preparing and all that, but it's different standing in front of, you know, a class of a hundred um, and being in some cases younger than the students I was teaching. Um, so it took some trial and error to sort of get my stride. And I will tell you that at one point I had an experience that was really, um, you know, eye-opening for me. So we were we were parsing a statute for you know what the meaning was because obviously in criminal law you know the meaning is really important and you have to find what's called mens rea or intent. Um, and I kept going back and forth with this one student and. And it was a, a young man, and um, he just was sort of not getting what I was trying to pull out of him. And finally, he just looked at me and said, what do you expect? I'm just from Arkansas. I was furious. I was furious because, first of all, I'd had enough experience by then to know that I had some really, really good students. And I said, you know, that, that is just unbelievable that you would say that. You know, I some of, you know some of you are as smart as anybody I've ever been around, and you should know that. And most of you are working really hard, and I don't want to hear any excuses. Mm -hmm. You know, you do your work, and you know it's not an excuse of where you are from, and certainly not from a whole state that is, you know, supporting your legal education if you didn't prepare and you aren't ready to answer the questions. But I thought, wow, that is a really telling remark. They don't know how smart they are. They don't know how smart they are. They don't believe it. They don't have the confidence about it. And I, I, was, I remember talking to Bill about it because, you know, having gone to Yale Law School and obviously people there are smart, but my students at mm -hmm. Fayetteville, you know, were already as smart or on their way to being as smart but they didn't have the confidence mm -hmm. in their intelligence that often makes the difference between yes. where you are and where you end up. And I thought, wow, that is something, you know, the state has to deal with. So, you know, fast forward a number of years when Bill becomes governor, one of the things we, you know, really focused on was education. And, and that was one of the root experiences that uh, I carried with me. So is there anything you want to add to that? Well, I just, I have that experience all the time with my students. Yeah. I love it about them, actually, that they don't know how smart they are. But I see them light up when, when, you, when you tell them how smart they are. They don't have that chip on their shoulder or that, you know, kind of ego that comes with it. But, um, you know, I always tell them it. They're scared to death this semester because I'm making them handwrite their exams on in a blue book, no notes. Where's the, where's the study guide? Where's the, you know, and I'm like, we're going old school and y'all can do it. And it was the best first set of tests I've had in years. And I told them and they were as proud of themselves as I had seen a class B. And I'm like, you can do this. You know, it's just no shortcut. You just got to go straight through it. And your generation has to interpret all this stuff with politics and you have minds and you've absorbed a ton mostly on screens, but they can write in a blue book. I can't read their handwriting very well, but but I, I, I sympathize with that notion that, you know, she mentioned, and I can't imagine what it would have been like to have her in a classroom in telling you, you're as good as the students I was around, you know, um, dig in deeper. Sometimes it just takes one that does that. Um, so I was I was touched by what she said there. I think we can forget, um, you know, we're, we're consistently in the bottom 10 of states with four-year degrees among residents in Arkansas. And we have a huge number of first-generation students that 
at U of A and a lot of other institutions in Arkansas. And that's also a huge opportunity, but it's also a huge learning curve for these students. And I love that that's one of the first things she noticed about the state was that there is, you know, there is this gap, but also that the students are just as, as capable, you know, with, with encouragement. Um, and I love that. Um, our next, our next clip um, is, I think, a great example of the interview overall because the Prior Center, we collect stories. That's, you know, it can pretty much be cut down to that. And what I love, one of the many things I love about this interview with Secretary Clinton and, and Dr. Maxwell is their stories within the story. Uh, Angie does a great job of bringing in historical context of what's going on at that time. And Secretary Clinton um, does this wonderful way of, of recalling you know, how it felt in that moment, what was going on and who she was working with. And so um, if many of us will, will know or recall that um, the early 70s into the late 70s coincides with Arkansas's, uh, I guess, more modern era debates with the Equal Rights Amendment. And um, so Angie and, and Secretary Clinton um, talk about this happening about the time that she's just kind of getting in, getting her feet into the ground and in Arkansas. And so uh, you and Secretary Clinton discussed this, this era. Well, you know, I run the Diane Blair Center of Southern Politics and Society at the university. And, you know, she surrounds me, the photographs, the materials, the legacy all the time. And one thing that I've, you know, if I could have any conversation with her, I would have the one about what was it like to debate Phyllis Schlafly on the state house floor in 1975 on the ERA when Sarah Weddington, who was the attorney in Roe v. Wade, was sick and a 31-year-old Diane Blair, mom of two kids, takes on Phyllis Schlafly. We don't have video footage of it as far as I've ever been able to find. We're still looking. We think we might. We might, we hope. We I am your first call if that happens, I'm no, just no. saying. Um, the newspapers wrote about what they wore, and that was it. Um, Jim Blair will tell you that she wiped the floor with Phyllis Schlafly. Um, and when they were doing the interviews with Diane for the Pryor Center, the oral histories, that is right where they get up to with Roy Reed that was doing them before she is too sick yeah. to continue. So I thought, I have to ask Secretary Clinton, what was it like? You're, you know, there's three women faculty members. It was Hillary Clinton in the law school and Diane Blair in political science and Ann Henry over in the business school. And they would meet all the time. And what is it like when one of your buddies gets called up to have that, you know, debate? And this is the Equal Rights Amendment and all of the fallout of all of that is a lot that I work on and write about. So I wanted to hear um, her take, what she remembered from it. So when you moved to Arkansas, it's also right in the middle of the battle over the Equal Rights Amendment. Oh, yes, it was. And I thought, too, <laughs> that, you know, um, sometimes it's a difficult time for women to make friends once they're kind of out of school mm. and in that environment, particularly working women. But you seem to have made some very close yeah. female friends yeah. in the middle of such a difficult right. time that divided a lot of women, particularly yeah. in the South. Um, you note, obviously, Diane Blair, who's another outsider, but also mm -hmm. longtime Arkansas residents like Ann Henry and yeah. Margaret Willard. Right, and stuff. And, right. Um, did those conversations come up often in early friendships? Was it that big on the horizon mm -hmm. in Arkansas? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the ERA had been moving along quite smoothly uh, until 19... Uh, 77 or so when the women's conference was held in Houston. Mm -hmm. You had two first ladies, you have Betty Ford and Rosalind Carter supporting the ERA. The ERA was in the Republican Party platform until 1980. And so people thought that finally the ERA, which had been introduced right after the 19th Amendment passed mm -hmm. uh, and women started to vote in 1920, um, the, the right and you know, the sort of um, political um, strategists of the Republican Party uh, had already begun to use race as a 
political uh, tool. And I think they decided that using women and women's liberation and uh, feminism and all of that um, as another political tool would work to their advantage. So in 1977, as I remember, um, the um, Phyllis Schlafly forces, mm -hmm. the STOP ERA uh, was in full force in a counter demonstration or counter meeting um, against the Betty Fords and the Roslyn Carters and all the other people uh, gathered on behalf of the ERA and, and a woman's agenda uh, to make the case that it had to be stopped. Right. And um, this, this all really materialized quickly. It was something yes. that was um, devised and designed and implemented fairly quickly. And so Phyllis Schlafly, uh, the housewife who was never in her house, um, right. became the leading advocate. And, you know, it was so ridiculous. This woman dressed to the nines, beautifully coiffed and made up and, you know, with, I don't know, five kids on the road constantly talking about how it was going to undermine womanhood and deprive women of their privileges and all that. Uh, these are the ladies who have successfully battled and defeated the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, these are the ladies who successfully defeated the plan to draft women and send them into military combat. And these are the ladies who successfully defeated the plan of three years ago to take away the dependent wife's benefits in Social Security. So my good friend, Diane Blair, um, was asked by the Arkansas legislature to debate Phyllis Schlafly <laughs> in the legislature on um, uh, Valentine's Day, as I remember. Uh, and, uh, you know, Diane eagerly accepted. Um, and she and I and other of our friends, you know, would meet and, and, and talk about it and help prepare her for what might uh, take place at the debate. And there's no doubt that she won on points, but it was clear that there was this big cultural, political move to um, raise all of these issues that would be uh, helpful politically for the Republicans, particularly, but not exclusively in the South. Right. You know, the shared bathrooms, the mandated military combat, all of that. Um, and so I think that um, for those of us living in Fayetteville at the time, it all seemed just surreal. You know, the ERA putting women into the Constitution didn't seem controversial to us, um, but we didn't realize the potency of the argument that was being constructed uh, to really um, make women's place uh, in society, part of the Southern strategy, part of the Republican strategy that, you know, was in the making and that we saw really come to fruition in the Reagan administration. So I know this isn't really a time to plug your book, but there's some, some common themes in some of your research, certainly in uh, what Secretary Clinton said. Moving ahead a bit, um, we get into the 1980s where um, Hillary Clinton is now first lady of Arkansas and there's previously, there is probably an idea of what a first lady of Arkansas does or doesn't do. And like so many other things, I think we can forget just how groundbreaking she was at all different facets, all different phases of her time in Arkansas. And in 1980s, she took a very active role in education reform and instilling and trying to uh, adopt new policies to improve education and particularly in K-12 and opportunities for K-12 students. Um, and we have in this clip a, a discussion that you and, ha you and her have on this issue. Yeah, um, you know, one of the things that I, you know, when I would stay up at night dreaming about what I wanted to ask her is, you know, she strikes me as having a very distinct problem-solving you know, um, way she operates or process. 
And because I don't really ever see the theater kind of politics with her. I mean, she's it's pragmatism, but whether you agree with it or disagree with it, it's I need to understand what the problem is. And that's a symptom of the problem. Let's go deeper to that next level. Let's like find it at the source. And like, what could we pragmatically do about it? And what is the path to do that? Which is something I'm always trying to teach my students, which is who decides that? Do you need to lobby a legislator? Like how many votes do you need for that? Like what, you know, that structural stuff, the details matter. And a lot of times track the solution. So I know it was, um, you know, it was a little bit controversial um, when, you know, she wanted to tackle education, but it was actually, you know, Governor Clinton that had tasked her with that. And her, I wanted to hear about her process because I, you know, had read all about the reactions to it. And like, how do you sell something that you know might be a long-term good, but it's going to have a short-term, you know, um, kind of negative reaction? And how do you stay the course on it? And I personally love love hearing her talk about this kind of stuff because to me, she's uniquely um, kind of sophisticated in the way she goes about balancing those things um, and not being afraid that she's going to get some criticism. If as long as there's a way you can get a couple of your, you know, items in place to do better for other people. And I think she met Arkansans where they were, you know, and I think Arkansans, once she did, gave her a shot. Um, so you'll hear her talk about when she was traveling the state trying to figure out how to improve education. And you, and you also tackled education standards. Yes. Yeah. Which, um, and which worked. It yeah. was controversial. I mean, over just a very short period of time, salary teacher salaries go way up in Arkansas. Right. Performance rates on right. the 11th grade tests go, you know, over the national standards. But yeah. it was a battle, yeah. and it yeah. seems to me to be a battle, particularly the part about teacher testing. And I think all of us have a responsibility from the teachers and the administrators to the legislators and the governor and every one of us who's concerned to say, you are getting something for it, and we're going to move forward together as a state. And I find that exhilarating. And many of the teachers with whom I talk find it exhilarating. And it has not produced low morale, but instead it has produced a sense of challenge and excitement that I find all over the state. Uh, so in many very fundamental ways, we are in agreement, but we disagree about the strategy and the direction that we have to go to get to where we want to be. It's about helping, convincing people to let go of a short-term fear for a long-term good which yeah. is so hard to do. Yeah. So I'd love to hear anything about how y'all did that. Well, when Bill got reelected, um, he was determined to try to improve the quality of education for everybody in Arkansas. And I had seen the, um, the disparities firsthand, not only by traveling around, but starting in 1979, um, I said to Bill, look, you know, we should invite every valedictorian or salutatorian or honor graduate of every high school in Arkansas to come to the governor's mansion. And because there were so many school districts, that was a lot of people yeah. and they could bring uh, their parents or their grandparents, whoever they uh, chose. These young people who are the best of our graduating high school seniors to be able to live and work in Arkansas and not have to go elsewhere because we don't have opportunities here. So this both encourages me and just spurs me on even more. So we opened up the governor's mansion that first summer in 1979, and it was enormous. And I mean, it lasted for many, many hours. But for a lot of these kids, it was the first time they'd ever been to Little Rock. Certainly the first time they'd ever been to the governor's mansion, first time they'd ever met a governor or a first lady. And we stood in the living room of the governor's mansion and we shook everybody's hand. And then they'd go out the doors onto the sort of balcony down the stairs into the yard where we had, you know, food and entertainment and stuff. And it was so moving to me because, you know, I, I started not only shaking everybody's, all the graduates hands, but I would ask them, so what's next for you? Mm -hmm. And there were so many instances, remember this was 1979, um, when kids would say, well, I don't know, I, I, I don't know. Well, are you thinking about college? Well, I, you know, I don't think I can go to college. And these were the top graduates for, from their high schools. I remember one uh, young black man from East Arkansas who'd been first in his class. And I said, so what's next for you? And he goes, well, 
I really want to go to medical school. I said, oh, that's great. He said, but I talked to the university and they told me I didn't have any credits because, you know, my school doesn't didn't provide, you know, chemistry or biology oh. um, beyond just the rudimentary uh, courses. And so they don't think I can make it. And I said, so what are you going to do? He goes, well, they at, they told me if I enrolled in a better high school somewhere uh, and took my senior year over again and passed those courses, then I could apply to go to the university and do pre-med. So this kid has done everything, everything right. This kid has studied. This kid has worked hard. This kid thought that this would be his ticket to do what he wants to do. And because his school couldn't provide that kind of academic uh, curriculum, mm -hmm. he can't compete with somebody from Central High School or Fayetteville High School or Jonesboro High School. He, you know, he just can't. Um, and I thought, boy, that is just wrong. So there were so many instances because we did it again in the summer of 1980. And then obviously Bill loses. And uh, so when he asked me to do the Education Standards Committee, I immediately said yes. And we had a great committee. And we held hearings in all 75 counties. We traveled the entire state. Um, and we saw that, you know, there were lots of political obstacles to raising teacher salaries. Because at that time in Arkansas, fewer than 10% of the adult population had a college degree. So teachers were a big proportion of mm -hmm. that. But 90% of the people in the state didn't have a college degree and they're working hard and they're wondering why teachers who in their view get three months off right. and work a short day, why should they get more money? So we had a lot of explaining mm -hmm. to do and convincing uh, to try to undertake. And then we had a problem with all the complaints about teachers. So as we would travel, people would say, look at this note that this teacher you know, sent home. Those words are misspelled. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. there's lots of you know, mixed feelings. Yeah, we need good teachers, but we don't have them. Or they yeah. shouldn't get paid more than, you know, somebody who works hard gets paid. Lots of conflicting uh, views. And then, of course, we had too many school districts, but trying to consolidate schools was like yeah. a third rail. That was really difficult. Um, and then what was the curriculum going to be? And curriculum is always controversial. So, we kind of, you know, winded, winded our way through all of this obstacle course and made our, our recommendations to the legislature. And in it, we recommended a sales tax increase combined with a teacher test. So, you know, the teachers were really upset and they were, they were mad at me. And I was saying, well, I don't know how else to get you a raise. I don't know how else to raise the sales tax because right. I can make the case that teachers need to be paid more, but of course, every teacher needs to be qualified. And they right. rightly said, that's humiliating. I graduated from college. I said, well, then the test should be no problem. It's just the principle of the test that they, yeah. you know, then said was the uh, issue. It was very controversial. However, we got the sales tax increase. Mm -hmm. And within a few years, the teachers had $5,000 more in their pockets. And we had gone from being one of the lowest scoring states in the country to a few years later, having our 11th graders score above the national average. So we could point to really positive yes. changes. Um, and it was an incredibly, um, you know, worthwhile collaborative effort because there were people who didn't like, pe you know, parts and bits of the, of the uh, program, but overall the state embraced it and the changes were made and, you know, some really good things uh, came from it. So um, I, I'm very proud of that. You know, in your, your conversation, whether it becomes apparent time and time again, and I think education is an example of this where um, she sees a problem she fixes the problem, uh, especially if it's a systemic. She has a really a good gift of finding, you know, that one student she's speaking to, she's seeing a systemic problem that is that can be fixed. And then she, as you touched on, she's she's a pragmatist. She she's you know half a loaf's better than no loaf. Um, and and I think that's you captured that in that conversation about uh, the education reform. Is there anything you'd like to add about that one? I just think it's. I mean, it almost made me tired when she was talking about 75 counties. She listened first. She listened first. And even when something's really, you know, and she knew we can't do all of it. So what can we do as a trade-off and how do we explain it meaningful to people in the state? And I just, those are good lessons, I think, always 
for all of us. She didn't assume she knew because she was from some fancy school, all 75 counties, and let's figure out, okay, we have multiple problems, but which ones can we pair kind of and solve? Um, and, and, you know, it's just, it is a, it's admirable to me that someone listened uh, to folks who probably didn't have near as much experience with education, but she met them where they are, you know, which I think is, is why our Kansans did embrace it. And it's credit to our Kansans, I think, honestly, because it was controversial. I get it. And I, I can, my mom was a teacher. I, t I can totally see the reaction to I've got to take this test. And, um, but in the end, they got on board. You know, they stayed open-minded enough to give it a shot. Um, and I, that's what I love about the state. And had to help too that as you said she listened and she came to the table maybe not having a full idea that she was certainly not going to force on anybody she was going to come to the table to, to find a solution and, and hopefully I, I imagine that built um their buy-in a bit I would, I would imagine we could we could use more of that she knew how proud people would feel down the road when those test scores did what they did like when you could show a deliverable you know, she knew because of all those things she'd repeated about students of how proud the state would be. I mean, I feel proud listening to it, right? Um, and so it just, and how, how, how much, how good and smart and capable people were if they were given the opportunity, you know. A lot of times we use the term long game as a political, strategic sort of thing. She's, she sees the long game for public good, public service and public policy in this instance. And that's not always an easy thing to do, you know, when you're, you're in partisan politics. Um, switching gears just a bit, uh, this happened several times in the interview, and I think we've got a great clip of this where you and Secretary Clinton discuss in a very personal, revealing way how uh, professional women, uh, then and now, um, have to navigate balancing career and family and expectations and also the necessity of family and community for support. I remember reading this article and I brought this up to her by Ezra Klein that had talked about how Secretary Clinton compartmentalized things. And I, I read it as a compliment because I think it's absolutely what a lot of professional women have to do. I mean, I joke all the time at um, my, one of my local state reps, um, Nicole Clowney, her, our daughters dance together and we'll be at a dance competition and then you gotta go off and like, she's gotta, you know, work with somebody on some bill or something. You just switch hats all the time, you know. Um, as a mom and it's, it's good if you have a community to kind of laugh about it, but we're doing it at that level. She was first lady, traveling the whole state, working as an attorney, and she's a mom, and an engaged mom. You know, this is a, ve a very engaged mom who, like, sees in her kid what she feels like. I think that's what drives her interest in education and all of that. What, what's, what's good for my child, I want that for every child. Um, but I'm not going to lie when I say how hard it is all the time and how pulled I feel all the time, um, and that you're never doing enough and I'm not doing it on the state's statewide stage all the time. And I just, I wanted to hear her talk about it. If it was, because uh, it seems to me almost impossible what she uh, pulled off and to have such a great relationship with her child and to have raised such a, you know, wonderful child who does so much good too. Um, so I wanted to hear her saying, you know, I think we get to the part about the Christmas tree, which is hilarious. My mom always says that women make Christmas happen. That's her phrase for all of the planning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the labor, the emotional labor, mm -hmm. the we're moving from one house to another, <laughs> um, Bill Payne. I mean, I look at the timeline of your years in Arkansas yeah, and just yeah. the sheer volume of that kind of labor that you can see from moving and houses and finding schools and just all of it. And I, I wondered, how did you cope? How did you take a break? Mm -hmm. um, 
Where did you go to take breaks? Yeah. Do you yeah. have any advice <laughs> for, you know, or anything that you found yeah. that works as people try to keep a pace of doing that kind of emotional labor for families? I think your mom is absolutely right. Um, it is still the case that uh, women make Christmas happen, make families happen, make, you know, life happen uh, because it's something that we both choose to do and we're expected to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I totally get where your mom's coming from and tell her she's right on. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean you can do it endlessly with no right. break and no support and, and no gratitude. You know, sometimes the work that women do is so expected, nobody says thank you, including mm -hmm. members of their family. So that tree gets put up. I remember one time Bill was, I don't know where, I was sick as a dog. I was trying to get the tree up. Chelsea was a little baby. We were living on Midland Avenue, so we weren't in the governor's mansion. I was trying to get the tree up. I was coughing and hacking and, and you know, I thought I had it in the stand. I thought it was up straight and bam, down it comes. I was just like, I can't believe this. It was so Defeating. overwhelming. Just yes. the feeling like I can't keep doing this. And, you know, I have a husband who is, you know, more than willing to help right. in every way, but that doesn't mean that he gets everything that needs to happen in order to end up where we need to end up. And so my friends, you know, just having the friends that I've had over the years of my life, um, you know, taking breaks. Uh, in this case, when the tree fell down, uh, you know, I called, you know, the retired man lived across the street. I said, <laughs> his name was Sarge. I said, Sarge, you got to come over here and get this tree back up because oh it's God. all over and I can't lift it. I mean, people who you can count on, people who are yeah. in your life, close neighbors, uh, all kinds of folks. Um, and then, you know, we, we had good friends like Diane Blair was, you know, one of the best friends I've ever had. And, you know, she and Jim had this lake house out on Beaver Lake and we would go up there sometimes. And, it was so restful. I mean, it really was just a, a haven. And uh, I still, to this day, think think of a time when I got up really early in the morning, you know, went down to their dock, dove off into the lake. It was black um, mm -hmm. in, underneath the water. And it was just so out of body. It was a wonderful, restful, memorable time. So you just have to make that time. You can't <laughs> especially if you're working outside the home as well as working inside the home, you cannot drive yourself to the point where you are exhausted and just ready to, you know, scream and run away. And a lot of times women impose a, uh, an expectation of perfection on themselves. So it's not enough to get the tree up. You have to yeah. make all the ornaments and, it's not enough to have Christmas dinner. You've got to invite 50 of your family and friends so that you literally don't enjoy a minute of it. No, you got to stop that. You got to take a deep breath and be realistic and do what you can do, but not go so far that you are wearing yourself out. And oftentimes I, I've had lots of, you know, lots of friends over my life now. Um, you know, lots of times you have to almost stage an intervention with a friend because she's getting so like brought up <coughs> about everything. <coughs> and so, you know, no, you know, just, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do all of that. And that's an important message. It is an important message. So we've, we've touched a little bit about Secretary Clinton's just history. I mean, really a pattern of problem solving and finding solutions and finding common ground. And in our next clip, um, Y'all are talking about her ability to find very diverse backgrounds of people, right? Different, give different constituencies to achieve these these objectives, and and also kind of harkens back to a time that, um, frankly, I would love that we could come back to. Um, I wanted to, if you anything you wanted to talk about about this, well, this piece. You know, I forget who it was. It might have been John Brummett, who I was the, one of the first class I taught at the university. I taught with David Pryor, which is a gift. It was a gift. And it's the other thing I love about this state is, you know, if, if you love Arkansas and you choose Arkansas, people will give you so many opportunities. 
Um, and he brought all these speakers to class. You know, no one says no. Save a prior. And, you know, I just got to benefit from watching him. And I remember John Brummett came and he said, you know, they were talking about national politics. But he said, you know, politicians that do well in Arkansas do well nationally because they've got to balance the richest, the rich, and the lowest income of the low, and everything from rural to Fortune 500 companies and all of that. And, you know, we don't talk as much about how Secretary Clinton kind of interacted with some of the business world and the way she worked hard to, um, you know, make the whole state benefit from some of those, um, you know, growing big companies and, and that there was a way to celebrate that too because it is an achievement and an accomplishment and then also not to forget that it has its roots in Arkansas, you know. I mean, a lot of those companies have stayed in Arkansas and many wouldn't have, you know. And so I... I had not read much about that part of her life, and I wanted to see how she interacted with it, and it was pretty telling. Well, I mean, and I, this hasn't even come up yet, but I also know that you served on Walmart's board. I did. And I kept I thinking about, you know, how Arkansas kind of translates on a national and global stage because, I mean, Walmart and the Clinton you know, family and the Clinton initiatives and all that stuff. And, you know, there was a journalist once that said that, you know, in Arkansas, if you can make it in Arkansas, balancing, particularly in public life, balancing the wealthiest of the wealthy companies with some of the poorest of the poor, then you get a good mm -hmm. kind of understanding of the, of the country at large. Mm -hmm. um, what, what from Arkansas allowed you to make the national and the global impact that you, the individual, has had? Well, I had so many formative years here. Um, and, you know, I was privileged to see just about every aspect of Arkansas life mm -hmm. across the state uh, and to work with some of the successful companies that uh, were born right here in Arkansas. Uh, I remember when we were working to raise the corporate income tax, uh, raise the sales tax, try to get more funding into education. Uh, I talked to Sam Walton about it because I had gotten to know him and I made the case to him that, we, you know, we were really proud that, you know, they had started this humongous company in Arkansas, but uh, they had to recognize that we wouldn't have the workforce. We wouldn't have the educated mm -hmm. people who would actually stay in Arkansas, commit to Arkansas, unless we improved education. It was really so interesting then when Sam Walton formed a group called the Good Suit Club. And the Good Suit Club was a bunch of the executives of the most successful companies in Arkansas who actually came together at a press conference where I was present uh, to advocate for increasing taxes on them uh, because they thought that it was the right thing to do for the state. Now, it's almost impossible to imagine this happening today right. because so many corporate executives have no social responsibility. They don't, they don't care about the places that they um, are rooted in and have grown in. They don't care about communities. All they care about is you know, making huge profits that can then benefit their shareholders and themselves. But in that good suit club, you know, these guys, you know, they obviously were successful businessmen, but they also really cared about Arkansas. Yep. Um, so I learned a lot. Now, some of those lessons are having to be, you know, rethought because we're living in a different time mm -hmm. of so much uh, ideology and partisanship and greed and just the pure use of naked power to try to, you know, force people to do things, things that, we're not part of the culture in Arkansas. Frankly, I don't think we're part of the culture in the United States mm -hmm. until relatively recently, where people disregard the rule of law, disregard the norms that are supposed to govern um, our behavior with one another. And, you know, I, I learned a lot about how it should be uh, mm -hmm. when I was in Arkansas and how I hope it will be again, uh, where people are going to work together, where they're going to cross the lines that divide us, where they're going to be listening and trying to seek common ground and necessary compromise to get things accomplished. 
So in this, this final clip, um, you're near the end of the interview. In fact, you're, you're closing the interview. And um, you and Secretary Clinton reflect on um, really what, what Arkansas meant to her and what it means to her today. And um, it, it ends, I think, very powerfully and very fittingly um, with a reflection really of the state, but perhaps uh, a reflection of her as well. Well, you know, I mean, part of this is because I was a kind of an outsider. To, I had never met her until this day that this interview took place. It was the first time I'd ever met her. And I think that was part of why they asked me to do it. And because I came to it um, without a personal relationship. And, you know, I'd heard all of the stories and the, you know, the things that people told me over the years, the criticism of how she dressed or, you know, having to change her name. And I thought, God. You know, when you when you realize or you think or people tell you your husband lost an election because you because of your name, um, that she gave she she changed it. She she was willing to do that, and that was meaningful to her. I, I didn't change mine; it's meaningful to me for my own personal reasons. But because of the good she wanted to do, and I don't think a lot of people would trade something so personal in their identity for all of these folks, because she was like, if this just gets in the way, then it gets in the way of the good I, that we can do in this state. Um, I don't know many people like that. And I wanted to see what she thought, but you know, I thought that's gotta be bitter. Or that's gotta be upsetting. And you know, when she left Arkansas, it was so abrupt. We talk about that in a different part when you get an opportunity to watch the whole thing, but you know, they, you run the campaign, it's busy, and then boom, you won, and you're leaving. You're leaving. You're just up and out of there. Your child's up and out of there. Um, you know, how abrupt, as abruptly as she came to the state, was as abrupt as she left. And then you're not just leaving, you're busy. You're <laughs> president and first lady of the United States, right? And then a senator, and then her own campaigns, and secretary of state, all the things. And I just wondered if she had ever really stopped and thought back on what those years were for her here. Um, because I see them informing um, things she says and things she writes, or at least I felt like I could. And I, I wanted to hear her talk about it selfishly. I also didn't want the interview to end, but I had to wrap up. But um, she pretty much knocks it out of the park here, I think. Well, you have been to the four corners of the globe. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> and now kind of with the hindsight, you know, which is always 2020, what do you think Arkansas's, you know, greatest strength is? Mm -hmm. Arkansas has always, to me, you know, been a place of grit and grace. Yes. A place where, you know, people uh, did the best they could, sometimes under very difficult circumstances, um, but also were warm and hospitable and gracious. And, um, you know, that combination is a good combination. And mm -hmm. I would hope that uh, it continues to mark the state and uh, the people in it. I just wish that each one of you could have been with us on this journey for the last year, because everywhere we went, there was somebody who would say, in a rope line, at a meeting, in a cafe or a bowling alley. I'm from Arkansas and I'm so proud. Um, so that there can be, uh, you know, not only, you know, Arkansas pride, uh, but that sense of, of welcoming and belonging mm -hmm. that I certainly felt uh, when I first came to Arkansas and all the years that you know, I was uh, privileged to live here. Well, we could talk to you all day <laughs> about a thousand things, including things going on now, but you, the things you started in Arkansas have just continued and improved the state so much. And it owes you a great deal of gratitude and it's an incredible legacy. Well, I owe Arkansas this. big debt. So it's, it's mutual. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. So, <laughs> We'll
we uh, we want to open to to questions uh, here in just a moment, but um, it, it's apparent in these clips, and, and when you see the the full interview, you'll see um, that Angie gave Hillary Clinton space to think about something she probably hasn't had the time, really the luxury of a couple hours to sit down and reflect, um, uh, perhaps ever, but in a long time, uh, Arkansas and what it meant to her and what it means to her today. And um, on behalf of the Pryor Center, who has this distinct privilege and honor to add this interview to our Arkansas Memories Collection, I just I want to thank Angie Maxwell for really a lovely interview. Truly, it's it's wonderful. What questions do do y'all have? Do we have a mic? Maybe I can I can use mine. Angel be answering the question. No, come around with the mic. Now, <laughs> uh, a couple of things that the couple of couple of expressions that I have heard over the years, whenever they've been mentioned in Hillary's presence and in ours too, uh, that have always come across as being such nasty and irritating and absolutely disgusting are th expressions that I've absolutely loved over the years. And one of those is women's liberation. And the second one is affirmative action. And whenever they've been kind of said in her particular presence, it's almost as though that she was accused of being um, uh, supporters of those things in the most negative ways. Yet she's always done those in the pos most positive ways that I can think of. Any comment? Yes, I mean, it's a it's a really good point. And it's kind of when she's talking about the ERA and she's saying, you know, it felt like it came out of nowhere. I mean, one of the things that happens that stops, you know, 30 states pass the ERA in a year. I mean, it's just a done deal. Passes Congress 90 percent, House and Senate. That never happens. And then it halts. Part of it is because of the framing. It was a disinformation campaign that framed, you know, feminism was choice. It was just giving women all the options. And it got framed as a counter ideology, um, you know, was traditional gender roles. That's one of the choices. That is feminism, right? But it got framed as this us versus them for political reasons. And that's very effective. And we have to watch the kind of both sides isms of things. And, you know, if you, if you've lost the debate over the terms, the policy, you know, progress is probably going to, you know, collapse. Um, and she was very cognizant of that. Um, you know, the teachers, it could have been framed as teachers versus, you know, big government. It could have been, things can break down so fast when we do the us versus them. And I think part of the listening and part of the narrative that she would create and her team committees would create. Lots of people in this state worked with her, gave of their time to serve on something like that, right? It wasn't just her. Um, you know, she talks about dealing with, you know, when teachers were mad and what Chelsea would hear at school and how, you know, and the different things that she would handle when she got home. She saw it on every level, right? And she didn't let it break down into an us versus them. It's a really hard thing to do. It's a really hard thing to do. Um, but I think it's the only chance she got to get some policy stuff through. She would, she would talk to about, there's, you know, they'd have five ideas they wanted to get through. And she said, you know, some Arkansas were kind of gruff to her in the beginning, but by the time they'd listen, by the time they went, they'd get two of the five. She said, I'd take that all day long. I think the polarization we're in now, I think she looks back on the years in Arkansas and even things that were hard as good productive work, right? And people, even if they judged a book by its cover from the beginning, they still opened the book and read it. And that's a credit to Arkansas, you know? And, and I, I think it looks, it, she, she remembers it fondly. I think it was a... a it speaks to the independence of the state and people's minds. And I think, I think you're right, right? Like we can agree all day long about how you go about doing something. But if we start with, we have the same intent, right? Like we want this to be better. We have different plans, 
let's talk out why we think these different roles are, right? There's good ways to do all of those kind of policies. It just, that listening tour, you know, to me, but not just a theater one, you know, like one where they're really trying, they're doing qualitative political science. They're doing field interviews is what they're doing, um, you know, and taking notes and trying to understand and not making assumptions. Um, and I could listen or talk about that process all day long because I think I learned so much. I really learned so much getting to listen to her talk about how she, she's not afraid to even say the hard stuff or tackle the hard stuff or offend anybody. You know, she said, yeah, oh, teachers were mad at me, right? That's okay. It's okay. If you know you're working for something that's good, that will benefit them, it's okay. People don't like you for a minute, right? But you don't do insult stuff, right? You never saw that. Um, so it's just, it was just the, you know, the opportunity of a lifetime for me and a privilege, a deep, deep privilege um, to do it. So I'm grateful to the Prior Center and to Stephanie Street and to everyone here who helped make that happen uh, because it was, I, I'll never forget it the rest of my, for the rest of my life. Right? A lot of humility. You know, there's another part where she talks about, you know, another time she did like a thing around the whole state. Some of you may remember this, but I was fascinated by it. But um, there was a program that she had heard about in Israel about teaching, you know, how a stay-at-home parent, mostly at that time stay-at-home moms, could work with preschool children to get them ready for school. And so she had a group that kind of studied, like how do that, and they went county by county and the mo these moms showed up with kids that were under five because they were like, what are the things, how much, because we didn't have preschool everywhere. We didn't, I mean, most, we still don't, right? And, and the engagement from these moms that said, I want mine to go ready, you know, like how do I help them get ready? Like what are some productive things I can do? Um, and that's that root problem, you know, go all the way down to the source and, and, and find me a politician that'll go sit with moms with children under five and show them a curriculum that they can use at home to prepare their children. Show me one, right? Humility is right. Um, and, but it was, it's all part of that, like long game to see the state, you know, lift. And it was a very pragmatic to me thing is, I mean, this, you know, all the educational programs and, and have all the apps or whatever they're learning on now, but I was floored by it. That's amazing too. Amazing. In your interview, did she discuss at all her decision making in agreeing to come to Arkansas in the first place? What all went process in her mind? What she was giving up or what she? Um, she yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you've all heard the stories about how many times Bill Clinton had to ask her. So, Miriam, um, you know, she, prior to moving to Arkansas and one of the things she had done is work, you know, she went undercover um, into some of these segregation academies on behalf of, um, was it the Children's Defense Fund? Yes, thank you. Children's Defense Fund. And was trying to kind of learn, like, are these, are these schools, you know, she went to see for herself. Are these schools actually, you know, not admitting, you know, um, you know, African-American kids? Or is this just an, you know, an accusation? Let's go see if it's true. And I think she got very interested in the South, like a lot of young people did at that time, right, during the movement, but not in this, um, oh, I know everything and I can come uh, share my knowledge. It was more, this is kind of ground zero. Like, there's so much good that can be done 
if we can get a group together to do it. Like, I think she just saw the opportunity to make progress in places where there, w there wasn't another preschool program to go compete with, right? There was just absence of things that could be filled, right? Um, and so I think that part of her, I mean, I think it was a, a they were kind of a tight, a tight match, but I don't think she judged. I don't think she judged. I think she said this is an opportunity. Um, and I know that's hard because we all live in a state where we know, we hear the, I mean, put me on a phone call with national donors and I will hear condescension. I get it. It still happens. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't think she judged. I think she saw it as, um, you know, a place where she could be a helper. I, I really do. It does. There's not one ounce of it that comes out of her in that whole interview that was judgy towards, she's a little bit to a couple of judges and lawyers that she had to deal with <laughs> as a female lawyer, calls out a couple people that were rude, but um, not to the people, not to the people. I, I don't get that at all, at all. And so my guess is, we go, why would you come here? And she would say, why not? Well, you know, why not come here? Ooh. I mean, somebody else might be better. I mean, everything, I mean, it, it seemed to uh, a lot of the criticism was very superficial stuff, um, you know, which we saw all the time, but, you know, haircut, clothes, attitude, name, you know, stuff that wasn't scratching, you know, the surface, um, huh? The glasses, yeah. I think she was reading at a Razorback game or something. Um and blew that up, right? Um, I don't know. I think the the really, but you know what hit some of the really ugly stuff hit when she went national, not here, right? It was like, yeah, we're judging this book by its cover a little bit, but they would still do some depth. And it was like a slow building of a kind of trust and, you know, friendship. The, but the, the really ugly stuff hits nationally, you know? Um, so I don't know, so, I mean, who else lived through it or might want to share anybody? I mean, lots of, lots of folks lived through it, uh, which is, which has been uh, a great, it's great, been a great evening to see so many folks who, who were part of this era and who were shaped by this era. And, and many of us, uh, were, were significant, significantly shaped by this. Thank y'all so, so much for this conversation tonight. Thanks, John and, and Angie. And thanks so much for, 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 for this production. It really is a, a, a joyous thing to, to watch. And so um, thanks to everybody at the Prior Center for making it happen. And thanks to Angie once again for preparing so well and doing it so elegantly. So thank you all so much for, for this. Um, this has been an amazing week at the Clinton Presidential Center. We have had uh, thousands of visitors uh, here uh, this week. We've had one of the best weeks since in nearly 20 years. But of course, something a little something called an eclipse happened uh, that brought people from all over uh, this country and all over the globe to this place. And it has been a really magical week. Not only that, we've had three amazing programs this week uh, on three very diverse subjects uh, with, with really great high quality programming. We've had tons of school kids here this week. Uh, it's been a real flurry. Um, and what this reminds me first is, you know, this is why presidential centers exist. And we are so fortunate to have a presidential center in our backyard. And we take it for granted sometimes. Uh, and this week, uh, and I certainly take it for granted because I, I work here all the time. This week, it felt like the special place that it is all the time. And so thank you all for being a part of this program tonight. And I want to thank, once again, the volunteers who were crucial to making this, this week happen and the staff members at the Clinton Presidential Center that all this stuff wouldn't have happened without them. So thank you so much. We hope you all have uh, a safe trip home. And if you hadn't had dinner yet, 42 Bar and Table is still open. So thank you all very much. And again, thanks to John, John and Nancy. Thank you all.